So Gwen, thank you very much for coming to visit us. Uh, it's a great pleasure to talk to you today a uh, little bit about Burma. And I wanted to start off by asking you, one of the big problems in economic reform in Burma now has been the just the lack of capacity on the part of the government. Uh, people have this kind of uh, this view that uh, Burma had some sort of enormous totalitarian apparatus that managed people's lives in great detail. In fact, it wasn't like that at all. It was a kind of skeleton government. And that, now that we moved over towards a more liberal system, the, the shortcomings of that have become very apparent. Is that, is that still a problem, or is it becoming less of a problem? Well, it's, I mean, everything is slightly becoming less of a problem day by day as sort of more aid flows in. And in, well, in fact, probably too much aid is, is actually become a problem. But, you know, when you get things like uh, uh, the, your average courtroom would be lucky to have, I mean, there's still typewriters being used in, in some of these places. So it's not just a human resource problem. I think it's also a, a kind of technology and equipment problem as well. And as you so rightly say, there was this perception of this vast apparatus, I guess because of, you know, people's sort of knowledge of, say, the Soviet Union or something vast and, and you know, ten people to do one job when it would only require one. Well, you know, back in, back in actually the dark days of when Myanmar was under the worst kind of sanctions, in fact, there wasn't that much to do. So you did actually have a lot of overstaffing and people sitting at desks trying to look as though they were doing something. But these days, it's um, it's insane practically how some of these um, bureaucrats are overstretched. They work, you know, you get emails and uh, phone calls at odd times of night. They're clearly working seven days a week. A lot of them do. The ministers uh, work amazing hours. I mean, I've interviewed ministers on... Sunday night, uh, Saturday mornings, um, they spend half their time on the road between Yangon and Apidor, the capital, which is a five-hour drive. Um, so, you know, there's all these sort of strains and stresses on that system, and I think that's actually beginning to show in a lot of ways with um, hastily drafted uh, bills, uh, for example, and reports that have to be produced, like, overnight. You're not going to get the best work. In fact, sometimes you get really substandard. And a lot of bills now, are, it seems, parliamentary bills, are being, you know, having having to be either redrafted or uh, fine-tuned because they've been shoved through or, or cobbled together. So it, it is. Capacity, I think, is one of the huge problems. We're, what, about three years into the reform process now in Burma. What do you, what do you see as the most dramatic change? Where do you see that things have changed well, I've the been, most dramatically. Yeah, that's a good question. I've been covering uh, Myanmar for since since that early period of when the reforms, just when people were still very sceptical that you know the rhetoric coming out of this new government uh, sounded too good to be true and probably wasn't. So no one really believed it, and it was only towards. Uh, mid-2011 or later in 2011 that people actually began thinking, oh, my God, you know, this something's changing. And that happened. The seminal moment, I think, was the abrupt suspension of the Mitsun Dam project of China's $2.4 billion project. No notice, no warning. News came out one day that the government had cancelled the project. Yeah, I Not remember it was astonishing. It was people astonishing. What was more astonishing, and it became clear afterwards, was that they hadn't even informed Beijing that it was going to be, uh, well, cancelled or suspended, rather. So it does seem to be suspended. So having covered it since then, uh, I think what's become apparent, and I saw a bit of this last year, but I'm, I'm now convinced uh, that uh, even in the last couple of months, actually, that uh, what we're seeing really is is actually the breakdown or break up of the former order, if you like, and uh, the rise of new power centres and really the diminution and also maybe the transformation of the old ones. So, for example, people tend to forget there was no parliament in Myanmar three years ago. This new government came in uh, under this new constitution, which also provided for a new parliament. There had never been one. And uh, at the beginning, everyone dismissed this new parliament as a rubber stamp, toothless body that would just push through stuff that the government slung to them and say, you know, pass this law, and they would. 
Actually, Parliament has become ferociously activist. It often uh, refuses to ad adopt the uh, president's suggested changes. If the president <coughs> wants something, he often these days doesn't get it from, a, uh, from legislation. Um, the Speaker the, of the Combined Houses, uh, Thura Shweiman, is incredibly ambitious. He's already... He's a contender for president. That's right, and he's made no secret of that. And uh, you've got this incredible energy and activism coming out of Parliament. You know, not all of it is positive, I think, um, and I'll come to the, the reason why I think that, but just to finish on this uh, point, that uh, outside of Parliament, which I think has emerged as probably a power centre that rivals, you know, the central government at least, and uh, possibly is becoming... Uh, as powerful in its own way as uh, the other main ones, uh, the military, the government. Um, but beyond that, uh, you've got other sorts of centres. For example, opposition parties that actually function. I mean, they were banned like a few years ago. You've also got unions. Unions were illegal three years ago. Yeah, exactly. There's now, there's now 1,000, uh, well, nearly 1,000 unions. Uh, there's been like hundreds of strikes uh, in industry and a lot of these unions have managed to get better pay and conditions. That's real power to, in my view. I mean this is power that didn't exist before. Workers were either oppressed I suppose had to take what they were offered. Um, so you've got that and then uh, another very important uh, element is uh, civil society. So something like this former political prisoners group Generation 88 uh, has actually metamorphized into something that's sort of a hybrid between a political party, which they're very uh, determined to say they're not, right. even though there was deep discussion in the movement about whether to form themselves into a party to run in the 2015 elections, and I still wouldn't rule that out. But at the moment, they've become this sort of catch-all body that's out there sort of helping unions organise, helping farmers organise, helping local communities fight land grabbing, um, you know, they, they, they seem to be everywhere. They've got a national network. Uh, so they, they're building a very effective machine and something tells me we, we might see them pop up in the elections. Um, you know, the list goes on. I could name like 10 to 12 other sort of new power centres, if you like. Uh, uh, but one I will mention also is the independent media. That also didn't exist three years ago. The only daily newspaper was uh, our much-loved... Uh, super uber uh, uh, authoritarian style newspaper called The New Light of Myanmar, um, which is still coming out with uh, quite antiquated uh, English and uh, um, stories that are, are sort of bordering on propaganda. But uh, in fact, the propaganda these days is not about how evil the BBC is and how the America is sort of an empire of evil, uh, but actually it's more uh, benign sort of old Soviet style paper. I wanted to ask you about another point. Uh, until just a few years ago, the Burmese economy was, was really dominated by a very small circle of politically well-connected businessmen, uh, cronies, we might call them if we were so inclined. Um, have these politically well-connected tycoons experienced a, a change in their role? Are they still king of the heap? Or have they now found themselves competing to maintain their position with new players? Well, you know, it's a good question. And like you, I don't, I, I hate the word crony because it's so subjective. And, uh, you know, what is a crony anyway? Um, in fact, you know, America's full of cronies as well. If you talk about well-connected businessmen who, you know, happen to have good business ties and benefit from government contracts. Um, so in terms of yesterday's cronies, the well-known ones who would be, for example, the ones on the U.S. Uh, so-called blacklist, the specially designated nationals list. Um, they're still around. Uh, a lot of them are battling now very heavily to get off that list, um, not because they want to bring their families to the Grand Canyon or Las Vegas for holiday, but uh, now that it, investors are pouring in and you've got people like, you know, Pepsi's just uh, been the latest to, to sign up to invest there and uh, start um, manufacturing there, uh, they need local partners. There's all these big multinational companies looking for local partners. Under the current rules, even after the US suspended uh, sanctions, and let's, let's not forget that is temporary, but 
um, it's an incredible impediment for, uh, for any business to be on that list. No, you are not going to get any business done with uh, a US connected company. So that's clearly one, um, one uh, point for them. But that said, uh, I mean, there's a lot of, there's familiar names uh, to us all from uh, the previous regime who are still benefiting from contracts. And the reason they do is that under the years of military regime, these are the big companies that actually know how things work. They can get a construction project done overnight. They can, well, not overnight, but you know, they can renovate airports, they can build roads. There aren't other companies, there aren't, uh, well, if there are good cronies, there aren't good crony companies that have had this experience. So, in fact, you know, a lot of these foreign investors coming in looking for a, a, a very skilled local partner um, would actually like to partner up with some of these big crony companies that have had the experience and have the equipment and all that. So I think what you are seeing is probably um, uh, this old guard that is trying to reinvent itself. Some of them will get off the blacklist. I've talked to the State Department, Treasury, uh, the US Embassy in, in Yangon is now, you know, I think they've really got a list and they're actively working to get some people off it. So what you'll see, I think, is a is a gradual sort of you know reconfiguration of that uh, that blacklist and also the crony community. One thing that interests me very much is the um, issue of telecommunications. Uh, I was in Burma a little less than two years ago, and it was virtually impossible to get a mobile phone. There were almost no internet connections. There were no ATMs, um, and I understand that a lot of that is changing now. Can you give us an idea of how the technology side of things is changing? Right. It's just like the earlier point, your earlier point about capacity. I mean, everything is moving at, you know, hundreds of miles an hour. The technology, I agree, I have been, I was there when you were there and had the same frustrations about uh, internet and mobiles. And a SIM card for a mobile phone cost $1,000, uh, which is insane. I recently bought one for $140, and after this letting of the... I mean, the the big turning point has been this telecommunications bill that was uh, hotly debated last year in Parliament. And in track with that, the government's moved to let two uh, tenders out for um, upgrading mobile systems. And they decided in the end to award the contracts to two foreign companies, Norway's Telenor and Qatar's uh, Uredu. And they're under uh, very, very heavy conditions to roll out that new uh, system and network within... I mean, we'll see even more changes in the next, uh, I'd say, next few months. But already, it's incredible. I don't know what they've done, but already, I mean, the, the internet is a lot faster. Some people have fibre optic cable. Uh, SIM cards, as I said, have come down in price. The target is to have SIM cards that are, you know, like the same as Thailand, neighbouring Thailand, a few dollars. Um, so it's happening at a very rapid pace. And once these foreign companies sort of take off with their contract, I think the whole thing is going to uh, just, again, you know, go through another explosion. But, you know, you've got many explosions happening all the time in Myanmar with these rapid reforms. As so often in a newly liberal or liberalizing economy, you also have the problem of deepening inequality, right? I know that uh, we talked about this, rents in the capital are skyrocketing, property prices in the capital are skyrocketing, and yet a lot of ordinary people out in the countryside still have to worry about losing their land to some greedy local businessman or, you know, how to subsist on the daily wage. Um, how, how is that coming along? Are, do, are ordinary people uh, the lowest, the, at, at the kind of lowest levels of, of, of in income feeling a positive change from any of the reforms? Yeah, I, you know, I think anyone who claims they can answer that question properly is probably lying because you'd have to sort of travel the length and breadth of the country. A few people have. I've been quite, uh, I've been to quite a few uh, regions of the country and you know, it's desperate still in some areas. And, you know, in the mo more remote areas, I, I don't think people even realise there's a new government that's trying to do reforms. I mean, you've got these hideous figures like, um, you know, something like 60% of the country has no access to, you know, clean drinking water or the, and electrification is very minimal in these uh, rural areas. 
Um, there's, you know, a lot of issues. But actually, in the last year, I think this government, uh, the Tain Sane government, decided really to target grassroots, trickle down, um, deliver uh, recognisable, tangible improvements to local communities. And uh, the villages and rural areas I've visited lately, which are, it has to be said, sort of within striking distance of main cities, but they did not have electricity like a year ago and you'll go to a village and they have it now. So I think these changes are uh, happening, but just like everything in, in Myanmar, it's, you know, there's an expectation that this sort of stuff happens overnight. And so you've got even things like Aung San Suu Kyi, the great, you know, pro-democracy icon, opposition leader, was initially quite supportive of reforms. But these days her mantra is nothing's changed under this government. People are still... Well, you know, that's not exactly true, but it is very hard to electrify a whole desperately poor country overnight. So, you know, this is kind of a step-by-step -step process, but I actually think that... Uh, this is nearly three years on and you are actually beginning to see these basic things kicking through.